Uh, hello, folks. It's uh, John McGuire here. I'm with Neil Waters. Hello, everyone. Congratulations, mate. Did you watch the doco tonight? Uh, no, I didn't. I was busy sharing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, was... I, 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 I still, um, I think I overdosed on it, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still not ready. <laughs> I, I haven't watched it this year. I must admit, this year I haven't watched it at all. I did watch yeah. it a couple of times last year. Um, yeah. I, I don't mind watching it. I haven't overwatched it, but um, I don't need to watch it at this point in time, that's for sure. <laughs> and um, were, you, were you happy with the doco, Neil? And, and you know, what was the uh, what was the intention of the doco and uh, did, did we achieve that? Well, overall, I think we achieved more than what we set out to, really, to be honest. We didn't aim to prove it. We aimed to raise awareness and, and we did that. Um, and we we got, um, you know, quite a bit of evidence along the way. No proof. No, we didn't get proof. We nearly got proof twice, once with a DNA test and um, once with a video, as we saw right at the end of the doco there. Um, but overall, I think what you put together, John, was fantastic. Um, as you know well and truly, there's an hour's worth of footage that we both agreed should be in it that you edited out. Um, on the on the cutting room floor, as you always do when you when you're putting something like that together. So, you know, we've still got enough footage probably to do at least a good tight thirty minute video with all the stuff that we're putting together now with me and Tazzy and stuff too. So, yeah, it it it's it's still got a lot of potential. I mean, it was two and a half years ago when we released this thing now. So, to be able to share it with people now. Um, in its third year um, and give everyone a chance because we, we've had such a, a huge amount of activity in the group um, recently with all the stuff with SBS and some of the other articles we've had. We've had some great press. So, you know, a lot of people are, are catching up still. We're, we're always playing catch-up with our members in this group. <laughs> people get picked up by the thylacine along the way all the time. It's like a bit of a vortex that sucks people in. So there's a lot of recovering of a lot of material for us and it's no hassle most of the time. Sometimes we get a bit tired of it, but people are so refreshed by it when they get the info and they're so amazed at how much info we've managed to put together. Um, it sort of keeps you happy to share it, I guess. Yeah, and for me a big part of it was honouring the people that have had strong quality sightings and, and you know, and, and are ridiculed and, uh, you know, if we can't believe people, what's wrong with us? So we, we, you know, heard some people out and shared some stories. So, and um, just the latest there, we've had 615 people tune in tonight uh, and they've watched the doco for 215 hours. That's over the last three hours. So, um, and lots of lovely comments now. That's fantastic. That's really good. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's really good to see that there's still, you know, I mean, when we started this crazy stuff off, we, we had about 300 members um, and now we're just about to breach the 8,000 member mark, um, you know, four years later or whatever it is, nearly four years since we uh, went international, I suppose, um, went global. Um, so, yeah, it's the, the interest is great. There's, there's so much interest there that, that people just keep picking it up and picking it up and... You know, once the the team from Walk and Fish Productions get over here in a few months, which won't be too far away, once once we get some clearance with travel, um, yeah, it'll get even more interesting again because you know they're going to come over here and we'll probably be here for at least ten to fourteen days, and we should get some really good stuff down on the can, I reckon, in the can. Yeah, that's that's amazing, Neil. And, and so, what's their angle of the dangle? Are they just following Neil Waters around and, you know, on the hunt? I think that it's not just Neil Waters. It's, it's actually about the animal. It's the hunt for the thylacine. So, you know, obviously a large part of that, but it's not just me because, again, they want to embrace the Indigenous culture like you and I did with our doco. They want to go one step further and, and try and get to um, Darwin as well and get the Indigenous perspective from up there with a couple of people that we've put them in touch with up there as well with Marie and her cousin Mandy. So, um, you know, if we can get them to pick up the few bits and pieces, I suppose, that we didn't get to put in our doco because of limited funds, then I guess that sort of 
complements our story anyway because they can pick up a few of the bits. You know, they could probably do something with Queensland, with James Cook University and stuff like that too. So, um, you know, Neil Waters is obviously an inspiration for it because they'll be following me around Tassie in the northeast. They'll be coming camping with me and Maya, if she's still here, she's doing okay at the moment. Um, yeah. And um, we've got a few witnesses lined up that we hopefully can be able to catch up with and meet out in the field and get their stories. And, um, yeah, as you know, we, I've got a hot spot at the moment where we keep getting these yips, so I'll try and get these good folks out there and see if we can get a handle on what's making these noises at night. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fun to be had, I'm certain. Absolutely, and um, yeah, I'm just running through the comments as you're speaking. There, lots of uh, lovely comments from people, and we re uh, we really do appreciate that because you know there's not a lot of us. So when we get that sort of appreciation, it's nice. And um, and thank you, of course, goes also to the uh, members of our group that supported us to produce this documentary. Hey, Neil. Absolutely, um, we raised over ten thousand dollars to produce this documentary with our GoFundMe. Um, I've copped a lot of crap from a lot of the detractors online about what we spent the money on, but I think people are pretty confident to know that we wouldn't shaft them. Um, we bought, I think it was about 25 trail cameras, plus we bought um, digital video production equipment. And let's face it, John, we, we probably spent in excess of 40, 50 grand over a few years of our own money to put that thing together anyway. I mean, the GoFundMe really helped out with equipment more than anything. I yeah. think I got a um, GPS that I use now and you and I got a pair of binoculars and that was about it, really. It was all gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But, yeah, it went to good use, that money, and, and it really did help us finish off the doco because John was using a, a borrowed camera when we first started filming, so quite a bit of the original footage was on borrowed equipment, basically. Yeah. Um, and wasn't that digital tape, that one? Uh, no, that was SD card. That SD one. card, uh, okay. Yeah, there are some shots that are off the old um, Canon camera that I had that are on tape, so, yeah. Yeah, I there thought there was. Tape. There is some yeah. tape tape in there. So, you know, to, to go out and buy a good cinema quality kind of, uh, you know, or TV quality at least camera isn't cheap. So I think all up with the camera and the equipment we had to buy for John. That was about three and a half grand all up as well. So it soon adds yeah. up. Um, but, yeah, the, the money we raised and the support we had and the continuing support we had from the members with the auctions and the art and, you know, all the sculptures from Alex Evans and the art from Matt, Matt Williams um, yeah. and all the stuff that Linda's put together with the shop. We had all that um, great craft and art from Woz originally as well. You know, we've had some awesome support along the way um, and some great people contributing and helping out. We've inspired hundreds of people to um, be out there and keeping an eye out. And even in the comments tonight, it's, I've been reading people saying they're going to keep an eye out in their area and look for prints when they're out there. And, you know, it's, it, this is what it's all about. It's just about raising awareness, really. Um, yeah, and that's been, a, that's been a team effort and that's why we're thankful to other people who get involved because Neil and I don't make any money out of this. This just costs us money and many, many, many hours of, uh, for Neil, travelling, getting around, talking to people, looking for signs and, you know, and I'm here behind the screen. I've spent a few, probably a couple of hundred hours behind the screen, you know, just trying to raise awareness really, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's it. And, you know, um the, it, those, the amount of hours that we spend on the ground, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky at the moment. I have the luxury of not having a job and I've got a little bit of savings there to keep me going. But by and large, you know, the, the money that we raise from the camera drive with the uh, sponsorship for the cameras, that's pretty well just covered the cost of the cameras and the batteries and the SD cards. So that's just one little less expense I've got to worry about, I guess, while I'm out here. Um, yeah. And... Um, I've got lots of area to cover out here. You, Dave, and Mark are covering some great area in South Australia. Um, we've got people in Queensland that are members of the group that have found some great evidence as well. New South Wales, um, you know, there's there's people, and you know, not to forget Western Australia, of course, with Wendy and her crew over there. You know, there's there's people on the ground all over Australia that have come together 
and you know then the support from all the international membership it's just fantastic yeah. it's been really good absolutely yeah and i guess there's a number of reasons for that too people you know we're all hopeful that maybe the animal's still out there i mean i'm really hopeful for um and i mean you've seen it i i don't know if i've seen one but um so for me it's just you know having hope and um i'm really looking forward neil to the next uh, card changeover when when's that um, well, I I finished putting out the last of the the new cameras only oh, about two and a half weeks ago. It was just before Easter, before Maya started to break down. It was Easter when she got sick, um, and she was walking okay before then. So, yeah, it was only about three weeks ago, and her and I went up the mountain together, and she did a huge climb. She did good that day. Um, so yeah it's going to be for a few months now uh there will be other cameras that i've got out still from the first round that were my personal ones i've got a couple of coastal ones out there um i've got a couple that i move around regularly some of the trail cams that i've put out i'm actually going to grab in clusters and take with me camping uh to right. different locations so i'll take them out of their place where they've been take right. them camping We'll get some action shots on them. So there, there might actually be a variety of locations on the cameras within the yeah. first round before I change the cards over. Um, okay. I have got about 15 cameras in one area in particular where we've been hearing these sounds. So that's quite hopeful and quite intense. All up, yeah. I think we've got about 20 cameras in that area. Um, myself and Susan have some other cameras out there as well. Um, on top of the group cameras. But, yeah, there's 15 of the group cameras there. So um, fingers crossed, folks. We've we've got um, our feelers out over as many areas as we can that we know are worth chucking an effort at. Um, and like I said, you know, the, the guys back there in South Australia and, and, and other people around the place, there's a lot of people looking. Absolutely. And I saw someone asked you about the latest sighting. You said the latest one was in South Australia. Have you, have you got anything else you can tell us about that one? Well, that was up in the Adelaide Hills in an area up near Kaipo Forest, basically. Um, both myself and Dave and Mark and you have all spent, and Jim Leosti as well, have all spent some um, good time out in that area. Jim spent quite a bit. Um, Jim's had a few sightings up that way. Uh, I haven't had one myself, but we've found quite a few headless roos out in that way. And we had a chap in the group a couple of years ago by the name of Stephen who had, I think, two or three sightings with his partner right in the very same area where last week's sighting was, virtually on the same road. Um, there's a couple of big remnant patches of bush on private land that is adjacent to a, excuse me, a... Uh, a park up there and the folks that live on those properties adjacent to each other two two different families have both seen big cats or what they think are big cats and also what they convinced the thylacines so um it's not the first time we've heard of big cats in that area uh and a bit further south from there as well and north so if these animals are there and they're roaming around in those remnant patches of veg um, it would explain why we keep finding these kangaroos, adult, adult male grey kangaroos that are five, six feet tall with their heads torn off and their lungs gone, you know. It's a pretty powerful animal that does that sort of thing. Um, yeah, well, that's a unique kill style, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And there has um, been evidence of it. I mean, Jim Leosti found one not far from that area. It was closer to a, a chunga, actually. Um, only two weeks ago, I think Jim found a headless roo that had been mutilated um, right. and posted it to the group. So it usually seems to be in winter that we find more of it up in that area. I think they move further out towards the coast in summer, but in the winter right. they're up in the hills and they're and they're they're going through those areas and pulling their heads off of things and doing what they do. So mm. they do leave signs. And. Um Someone's just asked on Facebook, Michael has asked, he's been thinking about trying to collect reports in his area. Any advice on how to start? Um, yeah, the first thing I do is talk to business owners, um, <clears throat> people in service stations, um, bakeries, that sort of thing. 
People. Do you say to them, Neil? Do you do you mention the stripes or do you start somewhere else? I, I just, the, <laughs> no. I basically just ask them if they've had any reports of any unusual animals in the area, and yeah. then if they've got some sort of details of something, I allow them to give me that info rather than coach it out of them, sort of thing. I just see what they've got. Um, sure. Because I don't want to give them any kind of suggestion of what I'm looking for when I ask them usually until they give me some info. Um, and you'd be surprised. Like if you go down the southeast of South Australia, uh, just about every person you speak to has either seen a big cat or knows someone that's seen a big cat. There are, there are literally hundreds of sightings down there. Um, but I also made up some business cards um, regarding sightings when I first started doing this. And I literally just drove around and put them in shop windows and on notice boards and, and things like that. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people will contact you and get in touch. Um, and, of course, when you're out in the country, you've got to speak to the locals. You speak to the farmers and things like that. Always speak to the locals because, you know, they're the ones that see things. They're on the ground 24-7, you know, especially farmers. They're out there any time of night if it's harvest time and, and cropping time or whatever. They're going to plough the earth. Do you remember that guy we spoke to just out of uh, north of Nanup and he in the was it a cheese cheese factory? Yeah, that's right. I remember that. There was two yeah. ladies and a fella there, and he'd seen it twice, hadn't he? Yeah. Yeah, was that's it a right. Big, big black animal, wasn't it? Yeah, on a on a rocky outcrop, but he was convinced it was a thylacine. <laughs> it wasn't a cat. Yeah. So you know, there's I think there's room to suggest that there's quite a bit of color variation between either the cats and or the thylacines, whatever people have seen. Um, but we get quite a few different coats and colours sort of reported. There's even there's even some with some um, horizontal stripes I've had reported too, believe it or not. That's that's weird, isn't it? Mm. And there was um, there was a report from, I think it might have actually been Regina's daughter, of an animal she saw crossing the road south of Wilmington or something up in the Flinders. I can't remember uh, where. It might have been Oruru. Um, and that had bands going all the way around its stomach, but it only had two or three bands. Uh, so that's just something completely different again, you know. And I had something similar reported out in the Murray Mallee too at one stage. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I was just looking into the different subspecies of thylacines the other day. I'm not sure if that's the right scientific term, but... Um, was there more than one species of thylacine on Tasmania? There would have been, wouldn't there? There's a bit of speculation about that. A <sighs> zoologist incorrectly identified two species, um, but it was sexual dimorphism that he was looking at. Right. Um, and that's basically the, the, the fundamental physical characteristic differences between the males and the females, males yeah. being larger with a buffier head, females being more thinner um, with a narrower, longer snout, so, uh, yeah. or muzzle, I should say. Um, but, um, yeah, there, look, there's a – Andrew Orchard has said that he reckons there's more than one species as well, um, but there's no real evidence to support it. Um, I've said that there's more than one species on the mainland on, on a few occasions and been laughed down, but – you had the ones from the Mundrabilla Caves and they were really small and they, they had their adult molars. So, you know, they evolved to be smaller out in the desert, but they were still thyno, thy, thylacinus cynocephalus, but they were smaller. Yeah. So, you know, out in the heat when they've got to stay, you know, cool underground and they've got to be agile, I suppose, um, you know, they, they dig down in, in burrows and things like that. I mean, we've had several sightings of the going into lairs and, and dens and being chased into wombat warrens and all sorts of stuff over the years. So I think it's fairly safe to say that they do spend a fair amount of time underground. Yeah, and, and like, some of them are really quite small on the mainland. These are, uh, you know, based on fossils that have been found and science has told us there was... Was it six or seven subspecies on the mainland? I think seven all up. I mean, no. the the way Robin Nagorka described hers and what she filmed, that doesn't look typically like a thylacine, but it doesn't look typically like a fox. So there's a little bit of room there for, um, you know, the possibility that there may be a variation on, on a theme there. But 
you know, when you talk about fossil records, that's exactly what they are. They're fossil records. They're millions of years old. So yeah, if there's yeah. no physical records to back up the foss fossil records, then, you know, it's fairly safe to suggest that that's where those animals are. But, um, again, you know, lack of evidence isn't evidence of a lack. So um, you just don't know. You really just don't know. Um, I think with Queensland, there's definite... You know, if I was going to speculate, I'd say there's probably at least three different species of unknown large mammal predators on the mainland and highly likely that at least two of them are marsupial um, yeah. as a minimum. And that would be thylacoleo and a, and a normal thylacine. Um, but this Queensland tiger that a lot of the people up in Queensland describe isn't either. It's something yeah. else. This is that yari animal that the Aboriginal people up there call a yari um, okay. and that's that's another whole different beast altogether. Um, and there's some really good scientific notes about that from the 1920s where people witnessed it, scientists witnessed it out in the field, but they never got a sample. Like they never actually got to shoot one, but they saw it several times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these were the scientists of the day, the, the, the people that were out there discovering things. And it's mentioned yeah. in the in the um, one of the books of the marsupials of Australia, I can't remember which one, but it actually gets a write-up in there because they saw it, but they couldn't prove what it was. So it does get mentioned. So, you know, whether it's thylacoleo or it's a subspecies of thylacoleo or it's some other variation on a thylacine, no one really knows, but it's definitely up there and it's definitely not typical. So I'd say at least three, possibly four species of unusual large predators on the mainland. Yeah. Um, we've got one uh, comment from a viewer here. What area, this is from Aaron, what area do you believe much more research is needed and can only improve the overall search for the Tassie Tiger? The Nullarbor Plain. Yes. Pick me. Pick you? <laughs> Pick me. I've never done the Nullarbor. I, I want to do the Nullarbor so too, John. <laughs> I, think I, said, I think I said somewhere recently, like, go to, uh, you know, anywhere past head of the bite on the Nullarbor. This is like in the middle of Australia on the southern coast. And then just find a track, which aren't many, and head straight up and it goes all the way up South Australia to you virtually hit the Northern Territory border. There's a couple of Aboriginal communities in there. How far would that be, Neil? That's like... Oh, it'd have there. to be a good 800 k's or something like that. It'd, it'd be a fair, fair distance. Yeah, and it's all bush. There's nothing else out there. It, a lot of it's never been cleared. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of the last virgin patches of Mallee in, in South Australia actually out there. And it is protected. Yeah. I think there's some miners getting through there drilling for gas or something, but um, it is a, a conservation park, and I do believe it was handed over to the Aboriginal people a few years yes. ago, actually. So yeah. it is protected, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, that area is so vast and into yes. the Western Australian wheat belt across the Nullarbor. Um, and like, like you know, we've got the two cave specimens from the early 60s that were mummified that were allegedly thousands of years old, um, but in remarkably good shape. Yes. Um, and we had lots of sightings in the same period. We had th thylacine sightings on the Nullarbor in the 60s that were described as being black with white stripes. Mm. So... You know, and it's not the first time that I've heard of black thylacine still existing in modern times on the mainland. So, you know, never say never. It's a big old country out there. And I think the Nullarbor area is vastly unexplored and um, would have a plethora of unknown animals still getting around out there if only people bothered to look. Yeah, absolutely. Because the actual plane itself, yes, it's massive, but then the rest of the you know, the area out there is, you know, there is thicker bush and there is, you know, trees and it's not all just a low flat plain. That's only a part of it. And it's just a massive area, sand dunes, you know, um, hills and possible mountains. And there's all sorts out there. So there's plenty of, there's probably quite a lot of fodder on the ground, you know, potential prey for a thyler out there or any animal. Yeah. Well, presumably dingoes have moved all through that area, do you think, Neil? Um, yeah. Well, you know, they've, they've gotten past the fence clearly, so I don't think they ever completely got rid of dingoes. They may have and they may have breached the fence. I'm not a dingo expert or a thylacine oh, yeah. expert by no means. 
Um, but wow. yeah, there's definitely dingoes this side of the fence. So um, it's it's obvious that you know they're going to affect the environment in some way um if they're if they're doing their thing but um i think they're pretty hot on the aerial baits at the moment again south australia so the dingoes will have a limited capacity for a while i'm sure which is a bit sad um but it's good to have some apex predators out there even if there's not a lot of thylers but look i think the thylers and the dingoes have been wrangling for supremacy on the mainland for a long time and i think they've found their niches to be honest, you know, like they, uh -huh. they've, they've been together for on the mainland for probably around 10,000 years nearly. Um, yeah. Certainly Marie Munker is convinced they've been in the, the islands for 10,000 years and she found evidence to prove that. So, um, you know, dingoes have been around a long time and there's still thylacines on the mainland as far as I'm concerned. So clearly um, the dingo control probably helped the thylacine because I think the thylacine survives better around man than dingo does. Um, right. And I think that's why we still get lots of thylacine sightings in South Australia, but we really don't get hardly any dingo sightings at all or wild dog sightings. Yeah. I think yeah. I've got two wild dogs and one dingo sighting. Mm. So and, um, we've uh, got some nice comments about uh, I've lost, I can't find the comment right now, but one of our viewers said they appreciated the Indigenous aspect incorporated into the documentary. And I know that. Well, I know that we're both proud of how that came out, so um, that was a bit of a coup, wasn't it? It was. Look, to have Regina join the group and get to know her slowly but surely and gain her trust and um, her respect was a, was a real coup for us, I think, and it gave us the opportunity to share her knowledge and her people's knowledge and their history, more importantly, with this animal and it's still revered in their community because they still celebrate it because they know it's still there. So, um, you know, I don't think it was ever a huge abundant animal in those sort of environments. They're very dry environments, you know, they're very hostile. So, but, yeah, her sightings and and um, her family's sightings, um you know, and then there's a lot of tourists that go through the area and see them as well. We've got a lot of sightings in the Wilpena area over the years. We've got the uh, Doyle's footage. Gary and Liz Doyle's footage was filmed in Wilpena Pound in 1973. So, you know, the Flinders Ranges, South Australia, has a long history with the Tasmanian tiger, a.k.a. thylacine, South Australian tiger, I should say. Um, and... Um, you know that continues right up until modern times so that's 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 awesome for us to be able to share that and and tell the world their story and you know i mean even bob paddle's going to quote us on that stuff in his next book because no one had ever gone and gotten regina and ken's stories before so you know we we, we kind of blazed a bit of a trail there and i'm bloody proud of that that's that's something that i really wanted to try and get get a good um handle on when we went for this because I knew that, that that part of the story is imperative. It has to be. Mm. And that's just the uh, Adna Mutna, you know, perspective. So every, you know, group would have a, a different story, I guess. Well, you know, a lot of that information's probably been lost because of the, um, the whole um, colonisation stuff, but a lot of it was documented too. So some of the yeah. missionaries actually, I know Tyndale kept very good records of cultural stuff. So uh, even though the missionaries were kind of um, destroying culture on one hand, they were collecting it and recording it at the same time. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, the some of those groups still have that culture. Some of those groups have lost it. Some of those groups of people have, you know, they're no longer around. They were moved off their land and they've, They've all been either massacred or died of disease or old age or, or whatever, you know. There's There's been a lot of um, um, horrible tragedies that have occurred with our Indigenous people in Australia um, because of colonisation. As we all know, we don't need to go down that path too much. But, you know, there is – I'd love to get into all the museums, you know, with respect to the, to the language groups, but actually study their languages and study – what was taken down by those missionaries and what did those people know about different animals, you know. We, we know of at least four or five different Indigenous words for the thylacine 
but you know there is probably literally hundreds because there was hundreds of languages when white fellas got to Australia. Um, and, you know, they they knew their animals, they knew their, their totems, they knew their culture. So, you know, they would have all had stories about all of these animals originally and sadly a lot of that information has been lost. But luckily for us, South Australia still has a very strong Indigenous community in the Flinders Ranges and they have a very strong connection to land and culture and we were able to capture that and bring it to the viewers tonight, I guess. You're, um, what keeps you going, Neil? Well, you're pretty pumped up about finding this animal, aren't you? Yeah, I don't know if it's mental illness or... Um, <laughs> 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 Bogues draft, I don't know. It's one, something. Something keeps me going. Uh, honestly, mate, um, I guess... I guess, I mean, you know me as good as anybody does. Dave knows me pretty good. There's a few other people in the group that know me pretty good um, via the group. Um, and, you know, um, I guess I'm pretty headstrong. I like to fight for the little guy. I, I really mm. like, I like to, you know, I don't like injustice. Yeah. And the underdog literally is an underdog. It's not quite a dog. It's under that in as far as science is concerned because placental mammals are more superior to marsupials. Yeah. So it really is the underdog, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm fighting for the, the thylacine. I'm fighting for conservation. I'm fighting for the 7,000-plus witnesses between mainland Australia and Tasmania who are adamant with what they've seen, you know. It's... And, you know, until we prove that, if we can, then I guess I I keep fighting or I go broke and have to go and get a job, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, that's entirely probable. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, no. if, 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 if such a thing called tourism, tourism ever comes back after all this COVID lockdown rubbish, um, you know, we might be able to, invest in ourselves and do some more tourism stuff and i'd love to be able to share what i know with people and get paid a moderate amount of money to um share that information and and bring a bit of joy in people's lives chasing stripy animals all across tasmania and the mainland or wherever it takes me so you know i suppose there's a there's at least a book in me um i've, I've, I've sort of started one but I've got to make the time to do it because I've got time to do so many other things now that I'm not working. Sitting down and writing a book seems to be a bit of a drag. <laughs> mm, yeah, fair enough. But um, as soon as soon as the um, bans are lifted, Mayor and I will be back out in the bush and uh, doing our thing. We're doing lots of day trips around the place at the moment and still picking up some good info along the way and um, finding a few bits and pieces of interest. So... We went out today. Sadly, Maya wasn't up to the challenge today that I thought she was. Um, but she's actually looking really good. She just doesn't quite have the energy to do stuff. But she's actually breathing better. Her antibiotics are working. So mm, excellent, mate. But um, yeah, we'll we'll be back out there real soon, um, smashing it out. I've got some cameras that I want to go and collect and check um, that aren't too far from home. So. That'll be in the next few days, I suppose, if the weather is meant to come in horrible tomorrow, but I haven't seen too much of it yet. Um, yeah, well, we've had a, had a lot of rain over in Adelaide and there's a big band down the east coast, but um, I've got a comment here from Jen Clark. She was, uh, well, I, produced, I presume Jen is a she, uh, gave us that great comment the other day tonight. She just said, bloody brilliant, the scale of what you blokes have created in Tagoa, the quality of your productions, the lengths you go to, and the doggedness of your pursuit, awe-inspiring and hope-inspiring. Much appreciated. Thank you for sharing this. And that sort of is a fair wrap-up of a lot of the comments that we've got tonight. And that's really, really lovely, folks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's what that's the guts of it. That's what keeps me spurred along, I guess. I mean, I lose my shit every now and then. I'm a bit of a hothead. But I've had to deal with a lot of turkeys really? over the years, you know. Shut up, John. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to deal with a lot of turkeys, and I'm not a turkey farmer by trade, so, um, <laughs> you know, uh, but in saying that, um, look, you know, I, like I said, I've, I've got a, a dogged pursuit going on here, and, and I'm pretty headstrong when it comes to 
feeling like I'm right about something and just want to chase it till I can't chase it anymore, I guess. That day will come. If we don't prove it, we don't prove it. We, Like I said, it was about raising awareness. I'm not going to walk away from this with my tail between my legs all sad if we get to the end of next year and I haven't proved it, that that won't be me at all. And, and if I can still afford it, I'll just keep going. But, you know, time will tell. Time will tell what happens there. Yeah, well, I think the thing is that you've given it your best shot and you take satisfaction from that, don't you? Yeah, absolutely, and and I've I'm so lucky to have the support of you and Dave and Linda and Susan and Angela and Mark and everybody else within the group. Like I said before, you know, there's I I'm the face of Tagora and I'm the big mouth that makes a lot of the the noise. But you know, at the end of the day, Tagora is it is an awareness group of Australia. It's the it's encompassing it's 8,000 members and it's encompassing all of those witnesses and all of those stories and all of that rich history. It's way more than just me. I've created a monster and I'm <laughs> I'm sort of running in front of the monster, flat strap, and the monster's constantly at my heels. So, <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, no, well, I mean, there's a lot of people who share your, you know, passion about conservation and, and uh you know, some people say we're on a guilt trip. I don't think that's true. I mean, I think we're trying to, you know, just get to the bottom of what people are seeing out there essentially. And maybe now we can just go back a step and talk about the production of the doco because, mate, we had an absolute ball on that. And for anyone that hasn't heard me say it, I've never had a bad day with Neil out in the field. Um, we just have a ball out there because we're just out in the bushland of Australia and that's something we both love and passionate about. Um, had a, we, we had, had a few there. shitty ones online though, eh, John? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mention that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm honest. No, go on, go on. <laughs> no, in the flesh, never had a problem and, yeah, just stay offline. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, we went to... Uh, you know, Western Australia, South Australia, we've done a lot in South Australia, obviously, in the north, in the west, in the southeast, and um, Victoria, Tasmania. So, and Neil, you know, managed to uh, organise uh, to cover my flights so that I could go there and shoot this stuff with him. And so, I mean, that was a that was a hell of a journey producing that thing. And um, and then for the premiere, I drove across the Malabar with my son Jack to the. Uh, the premiere at Nanup and Nanup's amazing place. But, yeah, the production was fun, wasn't it, Neil? It was. It was a huge amount of fun. I wouldn't mind a dollar for every kilometre we did collectively. Yeah. That would be yeah, all right. Yeah. I could handle that awesome. right now. That would be, be awesome. But, yeah, it was – look, we, we were on a mission, mate, and um, I was in a position to be able to afford it. And like I said, you know, we spent our money carefully. We spent it wisely. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we didn't really spend any on beer and pizza. So um, yeah. we we got the job done. And um, I think <laughs> that when you and I and Dave went up to the Flinders that trip and we got booted off of that property, that was pretty funny in, in hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> when you look back on some of the incidents, that was pretty funny. Yeah. I think when we, when we went and met Kath the first time, um, yes. That was that was sensational because she was so illuminated and she was a little bit sparkier than she is now. She's still illuminated, but she's not as interested in talking about her memories anymore as she was back then. Um, yeah. So I think we really caught her at her peak, and she was yeah. she was such a joy to work with. And for you, me, and Dave to go to her birthday party in January this year when I was there for my daughter's yeah. birthday was just so special. And yeah. Um, yeah. I was so I was absolutely so gr grateful that you and Dave came with me for that trip because I really wanted you to be there and when Dave could be there as well that was just a bonus so and you know how did the weekend end up we ended up up burrow and filming some animal running across the hill that now has been filmed a second time so um you know it's again it, it's every link in the chain it's it's just amazing folks when once I started, you know, I started off with this file full of sightings that I got from the museum and, you know, some of these sightings, they were still seven-digit phone numbers. They were that old and I threw an eight in front of it and rang the number and someone answered and I said, oh, I'm ringing you about your sighting, you know. Back in 97, they said, oh, God, who are you, you know, where are you from? And 
you know, that ended up being Les Price that we interviewed for our docker. And what a great guy, you know. He had six sightings of this bloody thing. So, and then his wife didn't believe him. And then she was with him one night and she saw it too. So, you know, um, that once you start flipping over a few stones, if you've got a pursuit like this, my God, the amount of information and it's, and, you know, once we started getting involved with AFRA and I became a member of AFRA and then realised the capacity of AFRA's volume of sightings as well, it's just like, my God, this is massive. Well, now, it kind of never ended, did it? And, I mean... Uh, well, it hasn't. We're still collecting uh, sightings and I'm still chasing the f***ing thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Out the swearing on this one, yeah. I do, that's why yeah, I threw no, at least no, one no, swear word in. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, meet and greets that you ran, I mean, what a that was a great effort, Neil. Well done. Um, to get people out, let them speak in front of other people would have also seen the uh, strange, unidentifiable animals or unidentified animals, and um. Yeah, just the amount of sightings like, that we got at the Nanup meet and greet and the Adelaide meet and greet and the Tassie meet and greet. It was incredible. Well, the Adelaide meet and greet, I mean, seriously, these these people that like thylacines are lucky that I sung in a band for 20-odd years because the Adelaide meet and greet, I was on the microphone for four and a half hours straight, basically. <laughs> so <laughs> I was on my feet just talking on the go for nearly four you know, just, we stopped and had a break, but it was like four hours. So it was huge. And we had over 100 people there that came along to that meet and greet. That was awesome. That was an awesome response. And, yeah, it's just kept growing and growing ever since. It's like a it's a movement that I don't really control too much. I just sort of steer it, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I can't really put a handbrake on it. There's been, I'll be honest with you, folks, there's been many times I've wanted to shut the group down and run away and put my head under a rock, <laughs> but I haven't because I'm not that selfish. Um, but, um, yeah, it has crossed my mind because it's just been all-consuming and it's cost me quite a bit personally, not just financially, but emotionally and socially and even, you know, personal relationships have suffered because of it. There's been a lot of things that have that have come and gone in my life over the last five years and I'm still doing this. So to mm. to to doubt my enthusiasm or commitment would be a huge mistake. No, no, I don't <laughs> think anyone doubts that at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I'm the only one crazy enough to take this on to the extent that I have that can afford to do that. I guess it's a luxury to be able to do it. I'm blessed to be where I am at the moment in northeast Tasmania because it's stunning. I live in a town with 10 other houses and, you know, on a on a good day I don't even get 10 cars come past. It's so quiet and it's it's smack bang in the middle of perfect dry sclerophyll um, thylacine woodland, you know, and I've got paddy melons and wombats and I've, I even get quolls and devils at my house occasionally. Um, you know, the prey's there, the, the habitat's there. It's it's good to go. It really is. Yeah. No, and, yeah, it's a beautiful spot there. It's amazing. And But, yeah, no one would deny um, you your persistence and, uh, and consistency and um, your passion, obviously, and I suppose that's something that people are interested in because, you know, you don't, you don't see that a lot these days. People so passionate about something that they never give up and they just keep going. And because you know it's been a few years, and 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 I probably should add that you know people have been searching for the tiger since you know they couldn't find it. Um, so there's been you, you're not the first, and you oh. might not be the last. But, um, nah, uh, by no uh, means. And we're not the only ones at the moment either. There's a lot of people out there other than us. Look, and there's, you know, there's other groups on Facebook that have their own agenda and the way they roll, and that's cool. You know, we've all got our own way of doing things. Some of them come after us spitefully, and sometimes we go after them spitefully too. But anyway, Jack Bates has to have an outlet somewhere, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, is there anything in the, um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't ask this, but is there anything we should have put in the doco that we didn't? Oh, I, I, I honestly can't say yes. 
Um, again, I'll take you back to that mysterious one hour of footage on the cutting room floor. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm certain that they're only small details anyway, you know. It was because you're tightening up, you know, two and a half hours worth of footage to try and get it down. I mean, I know you want to make it 45 minutes as it is, and it runs out for a, an hour and 20 minutes, I think, so... You know, we could still make it tighter. We could still edit it more. We've, we've got lots of cute little bits of footage in there as segues and stuff. But I think it works. It flows well. It, I don't think there's anything really missing. I suppose if I was there when you edited certain parts, I probably would have got you to do it slightly different. But I was never disappointed with what you put together by no stretch of the imagination because... I think what you did stand will stand testimony as one of the best docos made on Tigers in recent years. Um, yeah, I think um, you and I have had a, an understanding of what you, you know we wanted out of this, and and uh, you know some people might know I work I've worked in television for thirty five years, so it was our intention to style things the way we did and the original Bindo video, like we just didn't, we were just banning the bullshit basically and we just wanted to get people's sightings out there and I think that's what a lot of people relate to, Neil, in the doco is that the, the sightings and the people that tell us about the sightings are very believable. I have sceptics that watch the doco and they go, wow, at the end of it, they come out a bit of a believer. So I think it's when you actually meet someone and hear their story and see that they're genuine and authentic, I think that was a really important part of the doco. Yeah, and, and I think that you, you've always rested on that and I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's it's about people. It's about real life, everyday, average people. Yeah. And they've all had a very similar experience a lot of the time, not all the time. Um, some people only notice certain things and that young couple towards the end of the video there um, that we interviewed at um, O'Halloran Hill, I think it was, um, you know, he noticed the stripes and she noticed the tail, you know. She didn't actually see the stripes, but that's often the case with sightings. Some people will see one thing and other people see other bits. But when you get all those bits and put them all together, <coughs> excuse me, lo and behold, You've got a really unusual um, occurrence, and then when you start scratching through all these, you know, sightings files from the museum and AFA and and the Tasmanian government or whatever, and you see all the common threads in all the sightings, yet no one can put all that together and say, well, you know, there's there's clearly something going on here. Why aren't we looking at this? You know, well, actually, folks, nobody is putting all that together and saying, why aren't we having a look at this? That's why my pig-headed attitude has taken over with this subject. So there you have it. That yeah. no one in the scientific field until the, the um, James Cook University in 2017, you know, for three years we were prattling on before they got on board, um, but they were the first, you know, university to say, oh, look, a thylacine, let's have a look at this, you know. Um and to their credit, you know, but we haven't had nothing since. They've been pretty quiet for the last nearly three years. Well, it is three years now. It was April 2017 they announced that. Uh, wow. And we haven't heard doodly squat. So who knows what they have or haven't found up there. But, you know, the, the scientific community doesn't really want to talk about the thylacine. It's like it's a dirty word. So that's fine. We'll pick it up. I don't mind a few dirty words in a sentence here and there. Yeah, and, you know, like all of us, we just uh, hopefully we'll uh, nail a, a shot soon that will just can't be denied. So um, one of our – oh, Susan's asked how many hits. We've had 690 views of the doco uh, since we posted it at – Seven. was that? 78, 39. So that was about four hours ago. Yeah. We've had 690 views. It's been watched. For 255 hours in that four hours. Woohoo! Yeah, so that's pretty good. Yeah. And um, currently, I think no one's watching it. So when no one's watching it, I'm going to click it to unlisted. But also, uh, 
Amanda Hickman says my uncle loves that you used one of his photos in the doco. Yeah, I know. I just saw that. I liked her comment. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, Amanda sent me a heap of photos. It would be a few years ago now because the doco is three years old. So it would be about 12 months before the doco was finished. Uh, her uncle had a – I'm pretty sure it was a swamp wallaby um, that had its head removed on his property and one of its arms. And yeah. that was one of the headless kangaroo photos that I threw in to the mix when you put that small section together. Um, oh, yeah. Regarding the doco, uh, if if I'd done some of the editing with you, I would have had a lot more blood and gore in there. Would there would have been a lot more headless ruse? Uh, <laughs> oh, that was lucky then. <laughs> <laughs> it would have ended up with an R rating instead of a G. <laughs> No, fair enough, and, and, you know, for the listeners, that's obviously a very important part of, you know, you, you can often tell by the way an animal is killed, for those of you that don't know, uh, what animal killed it. Is that right, Neil? Well, that's right, and a lot of hunters will back me up on this because they know their shit, and so do farmers, and I've had the same conversations dozens of times with various groups of farmers and hunters and and um, bushwalkers and stuff, and... Um, you know, foxes typically go in through the rear on a dead animal. If there's a dead sheep, they'll go in through the anus and they'll go straight for the offal. Soft tissue, easy to get in, they're opportunistic, they're in, they're out, they're gone. Um, Dave made a comment before about our trip to the Flinders Ranges regarding the goat that we found. We put two trail cameras out on the side of this mountain when we were up there and... Yeah. Um, we thought they were all set up good. Everything was set to go. Sadly, the trail camera didn't trigger. But when we went back the next day to pick up the trail camera, there was a male goat that was torn into about six pieces. Now, I didn't want to hang around, and we, we couldn't hang around anyway because we got thrown out of where we were camped. <laughs> but that's another story. Um, but, um, yeah. Now, we went there the day before and set the, the camera up and there was no goat torn into six pieces lying on the ground anywhere, but um, it didn't go past the camera, whatever it was, and there was this goat adjacent to the camera that was just shredded. Um, now, the only thing I could think of that would do that would be wild dogs and they were yeah. killing it because it was a male and it was a territorial issue, I think. Um, that would be the only thing I could put on that. That's why they didn't eat it. They just tore it to bits. So um, if it wasn't wild dogs, then I really don't want to know what the hell it was. So if it wasn't a pack of dingoes, because we did see dingoes on that trip in the Flinders, they were there. Um, yes. So there's definitely dingoes in South Australia, regardless of um, the dog fence. Um, but, um, yeah, that whatever that was that tore that goat to shreds, it was pretty determined to tear that goat to shreds. So I'm hoping it was a pack of dogs or dingoes that were just de declaring their uh, territorial right. But, yeah, you just never know what's creeping around out there, ladies and gentlemen. There could be all sorts of weird shit, you know, yowies and zombies yeah. and and whatever else Dave says when he's, when, he's, uh, when he's out there with Jack Bates in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with the... Uh... Kills. Someone asked the other day about the collecting DNA off of a, an animal that's been attacked and there's remains. Yes. Uh, what's what's the technical aspect of collecting the DNA? Is that feasible? Well, it is feasible. I've tried. I, I found a headless kangaroo after our camp up in Mount Crawford two years ago, if you remember rightly. Yeah. We did that weekend up there in June, long weekend, um, with Mark and Jim. No, Mark couldn't make it, actually. It was Dave and Jim, yeah. Um, yes, yes. But, um, yeah, I left there, found a headless kangaroo, found its head that had been cracked open and the brains had been removed and its head was still attached by a tiny slither of skin and fur. Um, so I removed the head, didn't touch it, put it in a the biggest plastic bag I had, wrapped it up, took it straight home, threw it in the freezer, kept it in the freezer, then when it was time to take it in to get it tested, took it in, I got them to swab all over it for saliva, didn't find a cracker. The only DNA on there was Western Grey Kangaroo. Yeah. That was it. I couldn't believe it. 
Um, so that was a that was a bit of a disappointment. That was two hundred and forty dollars well spent, but um, unrewarded. Um, and then you know if you if you find a scat that is this fresh, you need to mix it. You need to put it in a sterile container with a mix of seventy percent ethanol and thirty percent distilled water. Um, if you haven't got that, put it in a paper bag and freeze it. Um, and, and then get it in to get it tested from there. I've been using SA Water for the last few years, um, and it was SA Water that discovered the Numbat DNA in that big turd that I found in Tasmania um, that clearly wasn't Numbat DNA because it was a massive, massive scat, um, and it had, I think it was about seven, 90 or 70% Wombat DNA in it as well. And it clearly wasn't a wombat turd because it was um, a carnivore scat. It wasn't Rubik's Cubes like wombats do. Um, so, yeah, it was a um, – there's there's a few bits and pieces that you can do with, with evidence, but it's got to be fresh, it's got to be frozen, or it's got to be stilled into, stored in distilled water and to a lab ASAP because I froze that head and I was convinced there'd be saliva on it because it had been cracked open. It's in the group, the photos, if people want to have a look. But his head had been cracked open like a sardine can, and the brains were eaten out. Not a trace of saliva anywhere. So you got to be lucky. And so, and does that cost money at SA Water? Yeah, it's about two hundred and forty dollars a test, and I think I've personally paid for about six of those now. Um, when we get the bill from the last one, though, to go and that one. <laughs> that's Absolutely. the one that's that's the one that Susan and I found um, before Christmas when we were down yeah. south. And we were, that was pretty hot, but um, that was actually a big quoll turd. That came back as a quoll, that one. But it, it looked just like a nice big fresh thylacid turd, so it must have been a big tiger quoll to produce a set that big. Um, There's some pretty, pretty big quolls around, isn't there? That lady that um, posted the video of one like a week ago or something, it was a huge quoll. Yeah, they do get quite large. They get up to about eight, 900 millimetres long from tip to tip, I think. A big one, right. um, and the tails can be quite long on some of them. Okay. Um, so yeah, they they do get quite large down here. I've actually seen black spotted quolls down here as well, um, which you don't see very often. But I saw a roadkill one once. It was black and it was huge. I, I thought it was a big feral cat, but it wasn't. It was a quoll. I saw the spots on it. I thought, whoa, that's black. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a few variations. Um, wow. And the devils are bouncing back down here too, which is good. Um, we're getting them on the cameras more and more often now, and I haven't found one with tumours in their face, so that's uh, promising. Yeah. Yeah, so you're seeing uh, all sorts of wildlife out there, and you're doing a great job sending us lots of video, and uh, I've been trying to turn it around pretty quick, so people are seeing, you know, footage from the field almost the day or the day after that you send it to me. So it's usually a day old or something, which is pretty current. So you're doing a great job there, mate. Yeah, well, um, I'm getting out as much as I can. It's been a little bit hard the last few weeks, like I said, because May has been so sick um, and she's had a um, abscess rupture on her, on her breast. So she's got this big hole in her at the moment. But all the um, yucky stuff has come out and it's looking nice and pink and healing. So that's good. Uh, the antibiotics are doing a good good job. She's she's looking reasonably bright. But, yeah, we'll be back out there in the next few days, I reckon, and we'll get out to our yip-yip spot and see if we can't get a couple more recordings and um, get a bit more of an idea of how far up that valley those animals are. But, yeah, it's good because where I am, I'm right across the road from the mountain. Um, there's a bit of evidence over there every now and then. Um, yes. We got a recording too far from there of the yip noises on Alex Evans' camera. That was over near the mountain somewhere. I won't say exactly where, but that that audio came from you know ten minutes from my house. So I'm in the thick of it, folks. It's just a question yeah. of being in the right place at the right time. Um, yeah, exactly, and, and obviously the amount of cameras you've got out there is just really exciting. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been that many cameras focused in the bush. Like that before? Uh, there has. The government, when they do a fauna survey, they get stuck into it with several hundred cameras, but they've got big budgets. We don't have that luxury. 
Um, John and I paid for the first 30 cameras out of the money we'd made from selling DVDs of our doco folks. So the first 30 cameras that went out um, back in December were paid for John by John and I. And um, then the next round were paid for by the sponsorships that helped pay for the next round. So, um, yeah, the, the, the sponsorship thing's been really good with reimbursing um, the kitty. So Togoa's got a bit of a float now, got a bit of money in the bank, and we can afford to buy bits and pieces. We've got to pay for our website to be um hosted at the end of the year linda has kindly donated that i mean this is another thing you know so many of the members in togoa's committee have committed financially to to go a heaps you know um angela bought heaps of art susan's bought heaps of art linda's donated shit tons of her time and money for different things along the way it's been a huge group effort. It's It really isn't just about me. I'm just the mouthpiece, like I said. What goes on behind the scenes to make it happen? And it's just a freaking Facebook group, but you've got no idea how much work goes in to what yeah. we put in on that Facebook group. John does long hours on the editing stuff. We've toned it down a little bit so he doesn't have to edit so hard because I'm making a bit more of a raw kind of product for you. Um, so that gives John a bit more freedom. But, yeah, John puts in a lot of hours. Dave put in heaps of hours trying to get this wildlife camera sorted. We finally got it sorted and now it shit itself again. So we'll get on to that as soon as we can. Um, but, yeah, all in all, it's it's a massive effort to, to bring you what we bring you. And I know that hundreds of you appreciate it because you send me messages thanking me for it all the time, emails. Yeah, that's, that's you know. you're doing this for really. Absolutely, because I ain't doing it for the money. Because let me tell you, we don't make <laughs> full money out of this. Me and <laughs> me and John made about three grand out of the doco in selling DVDs and the few screenings of it we did in theaters, and all of that has gone straight back into what we're doing. We never That's pocketed it. a cent of that. So um, this is all about our commitment to the environment. John's passionate about the animal and the environment, and we just happen to find each other at the right time i guess so you know and that's that's inspired hundreds of people brought in lots of committed people and it really is a beautiful thing to sit back and watch sometimes when i'm not stressing out over it i sit back and i really do feel proud of what we created because it's inspired a lot of people it's given a lot of people hope and let's face it what good news is there in the media these days the media is the most depressing thing you can look at most of the time so um you know and you know we're trying to give you a little bit of entertainment wherever you are on the planet i know there's a lot of people overseas tuning into us these days which is awesome in america and europe and south america and canada and all of that so you know we're, we're really happy to be able to share a wildlife with you and and just you know, bring some joy into your into your lounge room, I suppose, wherever your computer or your laptop's set up. Absolutely. And uh, Dave and I and Mark, we're trying to pump out a bit more content as well. As we know, especially Americans uh, that are in the group love to have a look at Australia and uh, we love to show it to you. So we're, we're sort of having a crack at that. We've got a couple more of questions here, Neil. Amanda, you can ask... Have you had many sightings come in during the state lockdowns? Have you have you noticed any change with you know the roads are quieter, it's quieter everywhere uh, due due to COVID virus? Um, yeah. Have you noticed any changes or the, anything else? Well, there's the, a couple of things I've noticed in my immediate environment. There's nowhere near as much roadkill on the road, which is good because there's nowhere as near as much traffic. Um, so that's one good thing. The conservation happening in that regard. Excuse yeah. me. Um, but, yeah, obviously, I've got the hiccups. Um, there's not as many sightings coming in at the moment. Mark had some great info come in last week that we were talking about earlier on that you guys are going to chase up. Mark's actually, he's right on the fringe of the northern part of Adelaide. And where Mark is, he's, he's in that northern area that goes out to the Barossa and the mid-north of South Australia. So he gets a lot of information from that area. Whereas Dave's down south, Jim's sort of in the middle in the hills. So we, we've got our feelers out really well across the Adelaide Hills, I believe. We've got Nathan a bit further south as well, down near Victor Harbour. 
So, um, you know, we've got people out there that bring info in and, you know, I'm not on the mainland anymore. I'm here. There's no point me trying to deal with witnesses that you guys can go and interview and meet and, you know, that builds up rep repertoire for you guys and a bit of a rapport with some of the witnesses and you yeah. might prove – I'll be absolutely stoked if you guys prove it in South Australia before I prove it in Tassie. I will be so yeah. happy. I'll come home, all right? I'll sell the house yeah. and I'll come home. I know you are. And look, Mark's picked up a few extra cameras recently, which is great. Dave's got a few. Jim's got an extra one I sent him the other day. So um, the arsenal slowly building up for those guys. And um, yeah, good, oh, kudos to you. No, no bullshit. If you guys prove it before me, I'll buy you all a bottle of whiskey. I'll be so happy okay. if you guys prove it over there first. <laughs> I'll have to leave Tasmania. They'll be after me then. <laughs> um, I've got one more question from Jane Downall. Uh, Downall, I'm in England, so I have not seen the doco. If they are present, what numbers do you think there could be? Um, that's a good question. I've been asked this before and I've speculated <laughs> wildly. <laughs> As you do. Look, in, in Tassie, officially, according to sources, National Parks reckons there I think, 200 breeding pairs on the sly in Tasmania. Right. That's what they said to Andrew Orchard off the record. So 200 breeding pairs in Tassie um, that are breeding every two years, having potentially, say, three joeys on average, um, maybe one surviving out of them. You're looking at a pretty slow breed rate. So if there's 200 after recovering from the um, the bounty back in the early 20s, 1930s, look, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say there's probably at least five or 600 of them in Tassie because yeah. those figures that I got from Andrew Orchard, that was 10 years ago, those 200, when I fed him in 2010. Now, as far as the mainland goes, well, you, you need to look at AFRA's sightings maps. Now, AFRA have got over a 1,000 sightings in Victoria alone, and there's, you know, several areas that have a lot of sightings at certain times of the year, and Peter Chappell did some very good mapping of all of these sightings, and he could predict where they were going to be pretty much um, and try and get ahead of them. That was the aim of the game. Yeah. Um, so... I say it's fairly safe to assume that you know you'd, you'd have to have a you'd have to have a thousand individuals on the mainland. You'd have to, you'd have to. When you look at the mass of the mainland and how big it is, how far spread the sightings are, and how long the history of the sightings is on the mainland as well, back to the eighteen thirties and and before, um, you can only. Look, dingoes have been removed. Aboriginal people have been removed from the land in most of Australia, in the southern states at least. So an, a sly predator could probably get around quite well and fly under the radar reasonably well under the current climate, you know, because there's, yeah. there's not as much gun, you know, there's still people hunting, but there's not as many idiots with guns anymore as well you know running around just shooting willy-nilly at anything hunters are responsible and they get per permission to go on land and they've got to follow rules these days so that element isn't as bad as it would have been 30 or 40 years ago i don't think so there's i don't think it's crazy to say there's a thousand thylacines on the mainland if there's one there's got to be a thousand i'd say but well, that's the other aspect of this isn't it like for them to have survived there must there has to be a certain amount uh, of you know genetic biodiversity to for them to survive. So I guess uh, you know there's a lot of math involved there. I suppose. Yeah. Well, I I worked it out once. I did a simple mathematical calculation based on the bounties versus the square kilometre area of Tasmania, and it worked out to be about 11, 12 square kilometres per animal. Right. So if you're talking about an apex predator spread out with an area of about, say, even if it was 15, 20 square kilometres per animal, you know, if there's enough habitat, 
you got to remember too, thylacines are seen in pretty much the same sort of habitat most of the time in Tassie, but on the mainland, they're seen in habitats that don't even exist in Tassie. So we're talking desert country, we're talking desert mountains, we're talking dry mallee, limestone country, we're talking the southeast where it's wet, we're talking the snowy mountains, we're talking the tropical mountains, we're talking Arnhem Land. We're talking the deserts in Western Australia and, and the Jarrah Forest and the and and those woodlands in southwest WA. So I think the animal to be on the mainland and still survive, it's very adaptable. Um, and it and it can handle just about any environment really when you look at where the sightings are, because they're in every environment. So yeah. to be in every uh, environment, you've got to be pretty good. Absolutely, and there's, yeah, who knows, like we were talking before about the different subspecies, um, you know, there's species out there that are smaller than a fox and, and you know, they're totally used to living in arid conditions, so they could be anywhere across the country. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look at South Australia. It's just about completely a desert, really. Even Adelaide only gets about 300 mil of rain a year, so... Um, they can survive in very dry environments. And there's there's speculation that they can survive without water if they're getting lots of blood. Um, so, you know, if they can sustain themselves drinking blood when they can't even get water, then who knows what sort of in harsh environment they could survive in. A lot of the time when you hear of sightings in some of those dry areas, they're talked about as being looking scruffy and a bit... A bit um, raggedy looking you know um because they're in a harsh climate they're, they're surviving on their wits you know yeah um i've had uh, deborah sweeney has said hi guys when would the next round of cameras go out i just sent my membership off and i hope my camera gets a great name i wonder what it'll be from deb <laughs> i can tell you now deb your camera's already out i just haven't appointed a name to that number um but i'll get to that over the next week or two we're just sorting out a few more memberships that have come in. Uh, Linda emailed me a couple of lists today for me to send out the membership packs and I'll do a welcoming email to everybody soon, all the new members of Togoa Taz Inc. Um, yep. And um, I'll get those membership packs out and uh, give everyone a name for their camera. It'll be Tawny Frogmouth or Bilby or... Bell frog or something, um, and um, yeah, uh, those cameras though, all of the cameras that are out now, like I said, I'll move some around when I take them camp with me and I'll use them around my camp. Um, so they'll basically be tripwise for whatever's coming into my camp because the idea is to stay in one camp for as long as I can to try and lure the animals to me rather than look for them, let them come to me. It's a lot cheaper to let them come to me. Um and it's a lot more practical too because it's it's historically known that that's the way they would behave. So if you hang around in one area long enough, they will turn yeah. up. Um, so, yeah, that, that should all come together quite soon, hopefully, and we'll um, have all those emails out and I'll appoint names to all the cameras and all the members that have sponsored them. And, um, yeah, I'll collect those cameras. I'm going to try and leave them out. The bulk of them will stay out at least till the middle winter, I'd say. Um, June, July, maybe even early August, I'll do a collection. But that'll be a massive collection when I do. Um, and, again, it may be that I'll, I'll have to sift through the best of the, the videos and photos. I'll just see how I go, how many false triggers I get. But, um, yeah, it's exciting times having that many cameras to look after, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's something uh, – there's a bit of – uh, South Australia pride swelling here, mate. There's a few people saying, uh, "Come on, SA, let's let's go and find the tiger first. So look out. Well, look, I can tell you now, SA gets more sightings on average than any other state, so it's highly likely <laughs> you'll get over the line before I do. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thinking of getting back down to the Coorong, like I said to you. You know, I was going through some of the old footage. You know, saw that print again, and it, it's it's on the money that one, isn't it? It's got the fifth claw happening, and yeah, that was spot on, and that was you know so close to the Coorong and not far from the main highway. It's like, you yeah. know, they, they just slide under the radar so well. These things, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
And, you know, something that's fascinated me and I haven't really chased it up is, you know, as animals are persecuted the way they were in Tasmania, you know, the ones that survive are potentially more, have greater awareness or they have attributes uh, that, you know, make them more able to avoid risky situations. So is that something, you know, in your experience, have you found out if that's something that, can stay in their DNA and, and the more the animals breed out, those sort of things. So I'm, people, well, yeah, I'm a video editor, so I don't know how, I'm not Englishing very well either, but... Um, <laughs> Englishing? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think animals build up these uh, aspects of their DNA that made it, you know, makes it harder to find them? Well, look, I, I really do believe that. And when uh, that lady, Jem pointed that out in her big spiel the other day, it just resonated with me so well because I said that a long time ago. Years ago I was yeah. saying that. It just dawned on me like, well, look, if you had a, a pretty smart animal and you took out 90% of them, the ones that were left you'd think were probably the smartest ones because they never got shot at or yeah. trapped, you know, in the because most of them were trapped. They weren't shot, they were trapped. Um so the remaining breeding stock has got to be pretty cluey and switched on and not inclined to be easily fooled. So if you had a breeding stock for 70, 80 years that had that much cunning in it, um, it's fair to say that the remaining stock would have a narrower DNA that clearly has a, um, a smart sort of tendency, but I'm not a geneticist. I'm, it's just a theory, you know. It's, it's sure. certainly um, no fact. It just seems like common sense to me with a lot of these things. So, um, and But, yeah, to hear other people say what I was considering a theory, just, you know, we had the same thing when we met Bob Paddle too, John, you know, because we were convinced that they didn't breed very often and that they're slow growing, and he agreed. Two to three years they breed. They don't breed every year, um, yeah. and they take two to three years to be ready to leave mum and dad's side. So, um, you know, that's an animal that's um, reasonably dependent on its parents for quite some time in the animal kingdom, really. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that it's not smart enough to do it for itself. It's got to learn like everything else, I guess. And um, some people are concerned that scientists or hunters will want to capture them if we, you know, if we produce a photo yeah. or, or a video, what's your thoughts on Look, I, I, protecting the animal? When I first started this, I was a little bit concerned and I was really, really protective over a lot of the info that I put in the group and I'd lie about where I collected a bit of evidence just so people didn't go there and I'd say I found it at the Coorong but I really found it on York Peninsula and all this sort of thing, you know. And to a degree, I still do that. I'm still very protective of what I do because I don't want to see the animals harmed. But, folks, I can tell you now, I've been chasing this thing around now for five and a half years, and I only got close to it three times. There's no way I could have fired a shot at it. You would have to be a dedicated full-time hunter um, that was prepared to roll his body in a dead kangaroo and sit in a tree in a loft with a rifle cocked waiting on a spot where you knew guaranteed they were going to come past at five o'clock on Sunday because that's what they do every week. This animal is so cunning in its wit and so capable of flying under the radar. I really don't think that me proving the thylacine exists is going to put it at a lot more risk than what it already is with industry, in particularly logging and 1080 poison baiting being a threat to it. I think that's a way bigger threat to it than Hillbilly Bob with his pickup truck and his shotgun going to get him a, a thylacine. That's yeah. just not going to happen easily. And let's face it, there is an element of people in Tasmania that still think that way. There is. There's, there's no dispute that there are people down here that are a little bit narrow-minded and don't really respect the environment too much or appreciate it. But... They're not all like that. That is definitely a minority of people. 99% of the people I talk to about tigers in Tassie want it left alone. And I get that and I respect that. But 
at the same time, the bushland down here is getting mutilated um, regularly for wood chips um, and um, not a real lot we can do about that at the moment because it's illegal to go and protest anything at the moment. So, you know, people have to be rooting for the environment no matter what industry is there. Yeah, we, we still need logging. We still need industry. We still need timber. You know, that's never going to go away. But um, we got to be at world's best forestry practices minimum. We have to be. And we have to be sustainable in a sense that we're not destroying biodiversity. It's all right to plant blue gum and pine and say this is sustainable because we planted more trees. But if you're destroying biodiversity every time you go in there and log and you replace it with monoculture, that's brain dead. I'm sorry. I'm not buying into that one. That's just stupid. So it's, Tasmania is the last arc of Australia's biodiversity as far as the small mammal populations go wiped out on the mainland years ago with foxes and cats. Um, so to, to, to manage Tasmania at anything less than world's best practices I think is criminal personally because um, Tasmania really is Noah's Ark as far as Australia's wildlife goes. And if, if the government down here doesn't do it properly, then the people owe it to the government to let them know that, I think. Um, yeah. And they need to be reminded that, yes, people need jobs in forestries and, yes, people need timber, but we need to make sure that we still do things the best we can. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not even remotely involved in forestries or any of their practices i don't know exactly how they roll but i do see a lot of logging and i do see a lot of monoculture down here and i'm hoping that they're not clearing old growth forests to plant blue gum because if they are that would be pretty disappointing yeah absolutely and um something that it's just very random the search for the the tassie tiger isn't it i mean you're you're really uh, focusing on some key areas, which and you've covered it with cameras, and you know not a lot of people have done that. Or, but I, I just know when I go out with the boys and we go searching around, it's it just feels really random. And uh, I guess we're looking for prints and stuff. But um, yeah, the animal, uh, the animal is random. The sightings are random, but. When you've got 12 sightings from the same area, the randomness tends to disappear and you say, all right, well, what day and what time was that exactly? Because you realise it's not so random after all. Yeah. So, but again, it's that waiting game. This is why I say me being unemployed in Tassie with a camper trailer is perfect because I can yeah. sit there with my solar panel, writing my book on the laptop, waiting for the buggers to turn up. And Maya, bless her, if she's still sitting there, she'll let me know because she'll start barking her head off when they get near. So, Plus you can hear, hear things at night. Yeah, and I do. I do hear things. And I hear things at my house during the day, but it's always just one noise. You'll hear one weird noise come out of the bush in the tin mine out the back, and it's like, what the hell was that? And, you know, that's happened probably four or five times this year alone when I've been out in the garden and stuff um and when my sister was here actually in july last year when i came back we went for a walk over by the mountain and we were just walking along this trail by the lake and we stopped and i said can you hear that and she said what and i said just be quiet listen and we could hear this kind of gurgling kind of growl and it was really deep and low and slow and i thought I said, I, th I thought at first when I heard that it was like a generator in the distance. I said, but it's just there in the bushes. Can you hear that? And she said, yeah. And then we stood there for a minute frozen and then we heard another one on the other side of the trail. <laughs> and we're, we're surrounded by like eight foot high bracken fern and it's just a jungle. And I said, let's get the hell out of here. I wasn't hanging around to find out what it was, but there were two of them and they were growling and it was it was weird. <laughs> It was weird. It was it was a weird gargly kind of growl, but yeah, we just got the hell out of there. We didn't hang around to find out what it was. Uh, nah, it's pretty. It can be a bit frightening out there, and you just imagine what it was like for the early settlers. And because I know where I live, just a possum sounds pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> what about a male koala? Oh, mate, it's frightening. I'm glad there's no koalas in Tasmania for that very reason. <laughs> 
worse email sounds worse even. You know what? I had a um, Tasmanian water hen turn up at my house yesterday. They come and nest on the little pond and it's walking around the backyard like it owns a joint. Anyway, you should hear the noises they make. It's a male. It's a real colourful one, so I'm pretty sure it's a male. They make some bizarre noises. I kept hearing these weird noises and I let some fruit out and it got smacked into this fruit. It destroyed these grapes. <laughs> it got right into it. Um, but, yeah, they make some bizarre noises. So, yeah, sometimes just birds will freak you out because you'll think, what the hell was that? And it's this weird bird. Yeah. It's crazy. And, yeah, like the, the female koala sounds like a, a baby being strangled badly. Yeah, it does. And the male is so violent with it when he wants to mate. He ain't friendly about it. It's pretty rough. He, yeah. and there's no come here, baby, and I'll and I'll sing you a sweet song. It's just straight into it. Yeah. <laughs> and fur going yeah. There's no candle lit dinner with that one. It's just wham, bam, <laughs> thank you, ma'am, and he's off, off on the next tree. You know. Oh, in yeah. fact, Dave had a funny night once. We were camped up. Um, where were we? Um, we were up the back of um, Kangaroo Creek Reservoir, camped on this fire trail of all places. We couldn't find anywhere flat. We hiked yeah. in with our swags and our tents and all this crap, and we are buggered. We walked all the way down this valley, so we ended up just saying, look, bugger it, we'll just sleep here on this track. Anyway, um, we're in a valley, just chock-a-block full of manigum, basically, which is koala's favourite food. And I think we had not less than about eight bull male koalas in that, 500 meter area that were just going off all night just bleh, 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 making their horrible noise it was it was pretty freaky actually not as not as freaky as the night we camped at that other place where uh, dave was just about wetting himself but that's another story i'll save that for another another interview <laughs> well there is a short video actually <laughs> We don't have to reenact. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I suppose we should wrap this up, Neil, and uh, uh, it just uh, maybe we can remind people that, you know, we're trying to create more exclusive content for members on the web page so that, you know, if we yeah. get members su subscribing over there so that we can help support you in the field. Yeah, of course. Look, folks, um, we've really appreciated the um, – interest in our membership for Tagoa Taz Inc., which is from our website, which is um, thylacineawarenessgroupofaustralia.com.au. Um, that's where you can actually become a financial member of the real tomorrow, I guess, that exists outside of Facebook. Um, if Facebook ended tomorrow, Tagoa still exists. We're an incorporated association. We have a constitution and a committee of seven lovely, dedicated people, including me and John. Um, and um, we really do appreciate the financial contributions that you make. John has, as we mentioned earlier, John's been busy making lots of different little videos, um, and we will keep putting some of those behind the paywall for exclusive uh, viewing by the people that have um, honoured us and paid to be a part of everything. So we will... We will give you that content. Um, there will be a few little bits and pieces of promos that we'll put through in the main group on Facebook. And then there'll be the odd video that goes to everybody that we'll share between everyone. Um, so we're trying to help you all out, I guess, with a bit of this COVID-19 isolation lockdown stuff. That's why John and I have been producing a bit more content. I can get it filmed. He can get it edited. He's stuck at home. So um it's and it's also you know to to give you guys some content and from the feedback we're getting everyone's loving it and really enjoying it so um that's great keep those 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 uh, words of support coming in that just keeps us pushing along absolutely and um yeah so as we end we've got uh, 730 no 740 views uh in the last four and a half years <coughs> excellent um, that's like one of the fastest sort of rating videos we've ever released for the first few hours, um, for the want of a better word. And, yeah, it's been watched for 284 hours. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I haven't got, as I've 
said to you earlier, Neil, I haven't got any uh, other data at the moment. It doesn't come in straight away, so I can't tell what countries and yeah, no, nah, that's all good stuff. But when uh, they do their report at the end of the month or whatever, yeah, and uh, I'm waiting for one person who begged me to keep it up because they were watching it uh, before I down and I'm just trying to see if anyone's watching it now. Uh, and we've had 20 listeners the whole time, pretty much. For, uh, we've been here for an hour and a half now. Yeah, no, nah, talk underwater with a mouthful of cement, John. <laughs> Excellent, mate. Well, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. And as I said before, I've always enjoyed my time out there with you, Neil, and I uh, appreciate your passion, as, as do everyone else that's commenting. And, um you know, hopefully, well, as Amanda just said, you know, hopefully seeing the doco will, uh, might trigger other people to, to feel more comfortable about sharing their stories. And because, like you always say, you know, not every, not everyone can be wrong. So, um, yeah, so thank you, Neil. And, um, you know, maybe we need to do a little, uh, a phone hookup every now and then as well. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea, mate. It's, it's just another medium that we can use. To- to give people info and an update on what I'm up to down here, and I'm more than happy to do that when I'm in civilization and I've got a good service. Yeah, absolutely. But I've just sent you another heap of videos for you to edit it, buddy, so get off the phone and get cracking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might start on that now because I, I tend to do a lot of it at night when there's, you know, then there's... Less there's disturbance. Fun. Yeah, yeah, and then I still do in the day but um it, and you know we're just keeping it really simple folks neil and i we're not to be, uh, um, a production house we're just trying to smash out some content for people and they just, so they can see you know what neil's up to yeah that's it and um the, the more people that get on board the, the bigger this movement i guess becomes and um hopefully one day the right sort of people are going to take notice that can pull a few strings. Um, we've already had a few p- good people pull a few strings with SBS, Vice Sand coming along and um, all the other great media that we've had along the way. But you and I will keep smashing the content out, John, and um, we'll keep the website ticking over. We'll keep Facebook ticking over. And somewhere along the way, um we will um, hopefully get the right sort of evidence that we're looking for. But whatever evidence we get, we post. If it's an ambiguous video, we post it. We don't care. Whatever we get, we share with the group. If you're you're annoyed by ambiguous videos, try not to comment on it and just keep scrolling, you know. Uh, We're sorry, but we like ambiguous videos. We've had lots of them, and one of them's going to have a definitive thing in it that will just prove it's a thylacine one day. My word. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, as um, you know, and just on that note, you know, that's why I revisited old Stripey Bum recently, or Stripey Bum recently, because you know we need to, we can't make light of the stuff we already have, and we need to keep across that, and you know, getting fresh eyes across shots. And, yeah, uh, and and you know, doing the split screen thing was a brilliant yeah. idea. Because that that actually, you know, gave us the comparison there and then with the cats and the wallabies and the wombats and whatever else walked through that spot. There's nearly 300 videos on that card when I finally found what was on it in my delayed reaction. But anyway, we got there in the end. Um, but, yeah, you know, that like there's some, there's some key features about that animal, to, in my opinion, that clearly shows that it's a thylacine, but it's just not the whole thylacine, sadly. But that little round ear at the very first frame, that ain't no wallaby here, buddy. No yeah. way. There ain't no wallaby in Tassie with an ear like that. And there's wallabies in those videos and they don't have that same stance or anything. So, And they're wet. They don't have stripes on their bum because they're wet, Mr. Yeah. Archer. Sorry, buddy, but I think you've missed the ballpark again there. Not yeah, to worry. Uh, what's that about? And uh, <laughs> Amanda, Amanda just said uh, just... Just wish Sid could see how far it's come. Do you want to tell people what we're about, the videos we're about to release shortly? Uh, well, we've got what I did today, which was all about um, 
the coast, I guess. It was only a brief one because Maya was not as well as I thought she was. Um, but we got the country in as well. We've also got a complete audio um, recount by yours truly of Sid Slee's book. Um, That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I've recited the entire book in three podcasts. So John's going to put that together in some sort of format and put that out on the um, members only page on the group as a little treat. So, because Sid Slee's book's a great little book, but it's hard to get. And Wendy likes to sell them in Nana because that's their their home of their tiger. So if you want to buy the physical book, you have to go to Nanup and buy one from the Nanup shop. Um, so because not everyone can do that, I asked when it would be all right if I recited the book and recorded it and made an audio blog with it, and she agreed to that. So, yeah, John, awesome. John will have that together for the members in the next few days. Uh, John's got a few other bits and pieces I've sent him that is lost in his emails, but he's been looking, looking, looking them um, there's a mutilated possum there's a mutilated wallaby there's a mutilated paddy melon that had its gonads ripped off they're all in there john you'll find them <laughs> um so yeah we've got lots of little bits of content that we can throw together and john will get through all when he gets a chance we we we're, we're smashing our content at the moment so um there's no hurry we've got plenty there for you to have a look at um, and I'll, I'll, as much as I hate Facebook, I'll, I'll keep putting bits and pieces in the group fleetingly um, when I come in just to check with the mods that they don't need any assistance from me. I try not to do that daily, but anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, but, yeah, look, it's, it's the necessary evil at the moment in my life, and it's been fantastic. I can't, I can't deny that for a minute. Facebook's been awesome to me and to Tagoa. It wouldn't exist without Facebook. So... But to get it to the next level on Facebook and make it a physical, real thing was always my goal. And we're pretty well there with that. We've just got to keep working on that model. And eventually when Facebook probably gets shut down by the CIA or someone, um, we'll have our blog going on our website and you can all just come across there and we'll, we'll have a lot more to talk about on there, I'm sure. Absolutely. And thanks again to everyone that's... Uh you know, Hannah Brooks just said, fantastic film. Thank you for sharing. You know, uh, Faye said, absolutely fantastic. Um, so there's, there's, yeah, heaps of those sort of comments. Thank you so much to you guys. It mean, does mean a lot because uh, you're the people we made this for. And so to get that kind of response means we've sort of achieved our goal with that one. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the call. And, um, Hopefully uh, you've all uh, got something out of that docker and you've got a little bit more of the puzzle in your, in your um, scope, I suppose, from where we've been at for the last five years, for all the new members at least, yeah. and we'll keep yeah. the content coming. Absolutely. Yep. Congratulations, mate. That looked great. All right. Good work. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, folks. See you later. Thanks, everybody.